This is Pete Sloan. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician at MedStar Union Memorial Hospital in Baltimore, and I wanted to share with you our program's approach to assessment for extubation in our post-operative open heart surgery patients in our cardiovascular intensive care unit. First, let me review some of the guiding principles. We have a fast track at our hospital, which are patients designated by our anesthesiologist as at the time of transition from the operating room to the cardiovascular ICU for recovery. These patients are deemed to be stable and good candidates for rapid assessment of neurologic and weaning status with goals of extubation within six hours of surgery. First, let me digress to define weaning. Weaning from a mechanical ventilator is defined as the gradual transition of work of breathing from ventilator to patient for patients that have prolonged ventilation and are partially dependent on the ventilator due to medical reasons such as neuromuscular weakness, increased demands on the lungs, or intrinsic lung disease. However, our fast track patients, by definition, really should not need weaning, but rather should be assessed for readiness for extubation. An appreciation of bedside physiology can eliminate the need for longer than necessary weaning trials and also eliminate the need in some cases for pre-extubation blood gases. So here are some of the assumptions. Most, if not the overwhelming majority of our fast track patients have relatively healthy lungs and have good pulmonary reserve. After surgery, these patients should be ready for extubation if they can tolerate modest levels of pressure support, about 10 centimeters of water, which overcomes tube resistance, and also maintain adequate spontaneous ventilation, maintain adequate oxygen saturation, and meet our existing extubation criteria. If a patient can maintain adequate spontaneous ventilation while modestly sedated, let's say a Richmond agitation and sedation scale of minus one towards minus three, they will be able to maintain adequate spontaneous ventilation when off sedation. Thus, it is unnecessary to fully awaken a patient prior to extubation. It is acceptable to start a CPAP trial while patient is under moderate sedation. Let's talk about some of the guiding uh, language we use to discuss these patients. First, our ventilator delivers a minute ventilation, that is the total ventilation delivered to the patient each minute. For example, a patient receiving 500 cc total volumes at 15 breaths a minute is actually receiving 7.5 liters per minute in total ventilation. In healthy patients, about 80% of the minute ventilation reaches healthy alveoli to help eliminate PCO2. And in healthy patients, the other 20% of the minute ventilation does not reach the alveoli due to conducting airways such as the trachea, and this normally expected part of the ventilation is termed anatomic dead space. In disease states, a higher percentage of minute ventilation does not reach the alveoli and is termed physiologic dead space or also at times called wasted ventilation. In our fast track patients, the proportion of the minute ventilation that reaches the alveoli should not change in the small amount of time that a patient is on a CPAP trial. So here's the master relationship. The blood PCO2 that's measured on the blood gas and also approximated by end tidal CO2 determination is equal to the CO2 production divided by the alveolar ventilation. That's to say there's a direct proportion between the CO2 production and the PCO2 and an inverse proportion between the alveolar ventilation and the PCO2. For that reason, if the PCO2 production doubles without any change in the alveolar ventilation, the PCO2 also doubles. And inversely, if the alveolar ventilation was to double without any change of CO2 production, the PCO2 would be cut in half. So, what are we really monitoring as we watch our patients? Well, at the bedside, short of blood gas, 
we can use oximetry as a surrogate to blood gas measurements of PO2 and oxygen saturations. In fact, the oximetry only measures the oxygen saturations, but if we are trusting the quality of the signal and we're happy with the oxygen saturations, we can presume that we're also happy with the PO2. In the old days, in the 1970s and 80s, before oximetry, we were obtaining a lot more arterial blood gas, so it's as if blood gas determinations have decreased with the advent of non-invasive saturation monitoring. Likewise, a more modern technique of end tidal CO2 monitor has made it possible to non-invasively trend blood PCO2 levels. The short-term trend in the end tidal CO2 approximates the short-term trend in the blood PCO2 with rare exceptions. These should not happen, these exceptions, during weaning or during I shouldn't use the word weaning during evaluation for readiness for extubation, but classic examples where there can be a disconnect between the end tidal CO2 and the PCO2 is acute pulmonary embolism and in malignant hyperthermia. Thus, an ABG very well may not be required if the patient is stable for 10 or 15 minutes on a spontaneous breathing trial and also trends of minute ventilation, end tidal CO2, and oxygen saturation are stable. So our program is implementing criteria to allow extubation and skipping the pre-extubation blood gas so that we would only require a pre-extubation blood gas for the following reasons. First, the last blood gas while on the ventilator was marginal with hypoxia a low pH under 7.34 or an elevated pCO2. In these patients, we would still like to get an pre-extubation blood gas. Second, pre-weaning oxygen saturations or oxygen saturations while on a CPAP trial are low. We would still like to get a blood gas. Third, if the end tidal CO2 rises excessively during a CPAP trial, obviously we would like to get a pre-extubation blood gas. Fourth, if we see a fall off in minute ventilation while on a CPAP trial by approximately 20% or more, for example, if someone's minute ventilation was 8 liters per minute before CPAP trial and then it went below 6.4 liters per minute on a CPAP trial, we might want to check a blood gas that will be recommended. Finally, certain patients we still would like to get a blood gas patients with a history of COPD, sleep apnea, narcotic abuse, morbid obesity, poor left ventricular function, difficult airway, or difficult intubation. So in summary, these are the reasons we'd still like to get a pre-extubation blood gas, but the good news is, based on the principles we've gone over in this talk so far, many of our patients can be extubated without a pre-extubation ABG if they meet the criteria on the last two slides. So we talk about watching the minute ventilation and our, on our ventilator, the Puritan Bennett 840, we have continuous monitoring of the minute ventilation. Um, as I mentioned, it's the product of the frequency and the total volume. In this example, 8.3 liters is a little bit higher than the 7.4 liters because this is a running average over the last 15 to 30 seconds where this is an instantaneous value. So I'd like to talk about factors that may prolong time on the ventilator. First, we have apnea episodes detected by our ventilator and an apnea alarm, which is actually quite annoying. Um, so the apnea alarm default setting is after 20 seconds, the alarm will go off, and then shortly after, apnea ventilation will start as a safety measure. So let's go through why this slows down weaning. First, it's normal for sedated and sometimes even non-sedated patients to have apnea spells during sleep. So there's not anything necessarily wrong with your patient when they're having apnea spells. Second, because the apnea alarm is set at 20 seconds, if triggered, it will elicit mandatory apnea ventilation. Once apnea ventilation kicks in, the patient's not really on CPAP anymore, so you can't be 100% sure that they would have tolerated CPAP alone since the apnea ventilation ventilates for them on a volume-cycled basis. Third, 
There, these apneas do not represent respiratory failure. Like I said, they could very well be normal relative to sleep or ongoing sedation. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times I found out that someone stayed on the ventilator an extra 12 hours because there was apnea and the nurse thought that there was respiratory failure had to put them on the ventilator to save their life. We know that that's just a normal um, uh, breathing pattern in people uh, post-operative sedated and sleeping. So what we'd like to recommend now is if someone's on a CPAP trial with apneas, we'd like to closely observe and certainly ask the respiratory therapist if they're com comfortable resetting the apnea interval to 60 seconds, which is on our ventilator the maximum allowed. We'd like to watch the minute ventilation and end tidal CO2 closely if they're having spells of apnea. My experience is that these either don't change at all or they change very little. Um, third, I would like to avoid going back on IMV unless there's a clear cut alarming rise of end tidal CO2 or the minute ventilation drops off quite a bit. And finally, if apnea spells rising end tidal CO2s or dropping minute ventilations are really interfering with weaning, I'd like to recommend that we try to decrease sedation and have the patient's rest score move closer to zero um, from a negative one or negative two, and of course, avoiding extra narcotics. Here are factors, here's another factor um, that can slow down weaning, and that is apneas are detected immediately upon changing from IMV to CPAP trial. If this happens, consider the possibility that the patient may have been modestly overventilated on IMV with either a relatively high pH or relatively low PCO2 right before we switch them from IMV to CPAP. If so, rather than saying the patient's apnea, go back on the ventilator, wait another four hours, consider the following. First, you can cut the IMV in half for 15 minutes to allow the pH to equilibrate at a slightly lower value and the PCO2 to equilibrate at a slightly higher value, which will frequently allow some spontaneous breathing between the IMV breaths. Then, after 15 minutes or so on a lower IMV, go back on CPAP. Another way to do this is to simply keep a close eye on the patient for several minutes while they're having apnea after being switched from IMV to CPAP. Let them have a low tidal volume. Realize that while you're watching their end tidal CO2 and PCO2 is rising, but we are expecting resumption of an adequate minute ventilation, provided it occurs before the end tidal CO2 has risen more than about 10 or the minute ventilation has gone down by more than 20%. So it's just watching if you're comfortable with that or the first approach is to cut the IMV in half for a while, allow the patient to re-equilibrate and to try a spontaneous breathing trial a second time. So the final factor is the the myth or the practice of trying to wake up the patient completely from anesthesia before we allow them to be extubated. So clearly a lot of patients, the majority I would say, do not like completely waking up from anesthesia with an endotracheal tube still in their trachea. Therefore, if a patient is able to support spontaneous ventilation while sedated, consider extubation as the anesthesia is waning perhaps at a rest minus one or minus two, and completing propofol taper and allowing patients to fully awaken after extubation when they're more comfortable. Once the patient is able to support spontaneous ventilation while under sedation, there is no need for a prolonged propofol taper. taper. Although anesthesiologists frequently simply turn off propofol and then extubate the patient as their sedation lightens, it's acceptable to cut the propofol in half once the patient is deemed ready for liberation from the ventilator and then five to ten minutes later depending on how they're doing if they're very light turn off the propofol, propofol and extubate at the same time and if they're moderately sedated still cut the propofol in half again and then turn off when and extubate when they're lighter
So in summary, I think if we apply these principles of basic physiology and watchful um, observation of our patients, we can wean them more efficiently and really miss some of the pitfalls that are unnecessarily prolonging extubation and also we can start implementing a new protocol to cut down the number of pre-extubation blood gases that are required. I, I thank you for making it to the end of this brief discussion. Hope you have any problems. If you're at Union Memorial Hospital, you know where to find me or my partners for questions about all of this. Uh, wishing you best of luck implementing our new protocol. Thanks.